Okay. Offset. Okay. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, if uh, you're from St. Peter and Paul, you're welcome. But if you're not, uh, you're also welcome. So, um, as we uh, as we gather this evening, uh, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your love, the sacrifice of your only Son, and your Holy Spirit that guides the church. We ask your blessings upon this evening, uh, that they will serve to draw you, uh, draw us ever closer to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, just uh, a quick announcement. Um, the, uh, I'm the warm-up show, actually, for next week. Uh, which July 2nd, Father Martis will be speaking on what did Vatican II say about the liturgy. And so please make sure not to, uh, not to miss him. He's always, uh, always very good, as you all know. Um, this evening, um, the topic that uh, I've been presented with is liturgy, trinity, and paschal mystery. And so it's uh, something very uh, light and uh, humorous. And, uh, you know, so uh, there won't be actually too many jokes because whenever you're talking about the Holy Trinity, um, it can be um, rather deep. So, um, but what I am actually going, so that's my topic. What I'm actually going to talk about is uh, Trinity, creation, the fall, covenant, Paschal mystery, and how the liturgy of the church wraps us in and communicates these mysteries to us. Um, and so uh, I should be able to wrap this talk up and you should be out of here no later than midnight. Okay, so I promise you, no. Uh, no, we'll talk for about 45 minutes and then if you have any questions, uh, we can, uh, can address those. But the, the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, one God and three persons, is the mystery of God himself and the most fundamental teaching of our faith. It is the mystery from which all the others flow. Creation flows from, the mystery, from this mystery as the source of our life. And fallen creation is redeemed and set right through man's relationship with the Almighty and the sacrifice of his Son. And the entire mystery is communicated to us in the liturgy of the Church. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines the Holy Trinity this way. The mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is the central mystery of the Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God and himself. It is therefore the source of all other mysteries of faith, the light that enlightens them. It is the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of the truths of faith. The whole history of salvation is identical with the history of the way and the means by which the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reveals himself to men and reconciles and unites with himself those who turn away from sin. The handout that you have that I just gave you is not, uh, it's an outline more or less of the talk I'm going to present, but also uh, really my talk according to the quotations that I'm going to use uh, to address the topic. So I gave that to you so that, because sometimes some of those quotes are a little bit lengthy, sometimes it's a little easier to follow along if you can read it. So if you don't have one of those handouts, uh, VJ will bring you one. Just raise your hand and he'll bring you over one. And then the other one is just a flyer uh, for the Year of Faith on, on the Eucharist. So uh, feel free to take that home with you. And if you want to uh, take a couple extras and give those to a friend, that's fine. The Holy Trinity, in fact, we celebrate today the feast day of St. Cyril of Alexandria, who talked a great deal about the identity of Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ was and defended uh, the authentic teaching of the church at the time and, in fact, proclaimed uh, and taught very uh, diligently uh, that Mary was the God-bearer, the Theotokos, the mother of God, uh, which is very important for Christology. 
But uh, that fits directly into our topic of the Most Holy Trinity and the connection to the liturgy. But it also reminds us that our faith is one that uh, is very deep and well thought out that the revelation that Christ gave to us uh, when he was here on earth helps us to understand our faith. And over the centuries and the millennia, the church has developed a very sophisticated doctrine of who God is and who Jesus Christ is, who the Holy Trinity is. And it's, so it's not something that we can take rather lightly. Um, certainly it has very concrete repercussions for us, but it's not an easy teaching of the church when the, the more that you dwell, delve into it. But the mystery of the Holy Trinity is the source of our existence. We can just start there. God created the world, and he created us, and God is triune. That means that the Most Holy Trinity is the very source of our existence. In fact, the existence of all that is. And the reality of the creative world reflects the central mystery of our faith, and as such, the Holy Trinity, creation, covenant, and worship are all bound together. It's not as if the mystery of the Trinity is one mystery, creation another mystery, covenant another, and worship still something else. They're all very intimately connected to one another, and that's what we're going to talk about, how that is. The mystery of God, the mystery of creation, the mystery of covenant, our worship of God, are all bound together, communicating God's relationship to man. But God establishes and reestablishes this relationship in a very special way. Pope Benedict XVI wrote, creation exists to be a place for the covenant that God wants to make with man. The goal of creation is the covenant, the love story of God and man. And he continues, if everything is directed to the covenant, then it is important to see that the covenant is a relationship, God's gift of himself to man, but also man's response to God. It's reciprocal. It's not just simply God giving us himself, but we responded, us responding. Man's response to God, who is good to him, is love. And loving God means worshiping him. That's the part that sometimes we miss, right? We tend today to understand a little bit better that commandment to love one's neighbor. But here Pope Benedict is saying that loving God means worshiping him. So this idea of the Most Holy Trinity and our worship of him are very closely connected. He goes on, if creation is meant to be a space for the covenant, the place where God and man meet one another, then it must be thought of as a space for worship. So the whole purpose of creation is to be a place where we can worship God. That's why God created the world as a place to worship him. No other reason, just that. But that tells us how important that worship is. Hence, God created man to worship him, and essential to this place God created is man's worship of God. We see this all throughout God's revelation to us of himself. For example, the story of creation has God making the world in six day and resting on the seventh. Now, I always picture God, you know, it's kind of like on Sunday. You know, I don't know if he watched the Hawks game, but, you know, I picture God resting on the seventh day with his remote in one hand and a beer in the other hand, you know. But that's not really what is meant there, right? There's something far more profound than just that he's decided to take his ease. Because, you know, the other thing about God is he's all-powerful. That means God doesn't get tired, right? He never gets tired because he's all-powerful. He can do anything. That means he didn't get in the lazy boy and put the, you know, put the little arm thing back, right? It means something else, right? Something far more profound than just that. Because, as Dr. Scott Hahn uh, notes, on the sixth day, man and the animals were both made on that day, right? So that means... Human beings in Fido, we were made together, right? We were made at the same level, okay? But it was not simply that God rested on the seventh day. It was that God made the seventh day holy. 
In some way, that's the place where human beings and animals diverge. Because the seventh day is the day of worship. Genesis reads, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Not just that he rested, he made it holy. The seventh day is the culmination of what happened in those first six days. And in fact, God and his relationship to man is the focus of the whole thing. The focus of that whole creation account is that it is as much about God and who he is as it is about the fact that animals were made on the sixth day. The purpose of the creation account is not to explain what creation is, but who God is and that God created us to be in relationship with him. The God revealed in the Old Testament, however, is significantly different than the other pagan gods at the time and even pagan gods later. The early pagans viewed the relationship of the gods and man as a cyclical reality. You know, we worship God and he gives us good things and then he gives us good things, so then we worship him, right? The gods bestowed goods on man and then men worshiped gods. In a certain sense, the gods needed man and gain something from the human worship they receive. This is in the pagan religions, right? Bare minimum, the egos of the gods were reinforced by human worship. In pagan religions, man and God are at times even set up as rivals to one another, but rarely with any true relationship of love and intimacy. The story of Prometheus is a perfect example, right? That's the one where Prometheus stole the fire from Zeus, right? And gave it to man. And then Zeus punished him. The jealousies of the gods in the pagan religion is purely selfish on the gods' parts. Prometheus takes that fire and steals it from Zeus and gives it to man for his advancement. But Zeus's reaction is, is that he punishes Prometheus not simply as a remedy for his sin, but because Prometheus hurt Zeus's pride. Don't you know who I am? I'm Zeus. How dare you do that? But the God of the Jewish people, the the God of the Jewish people, establishes from the very start a relationship of love with man. Even punishment for a transgression is a remedy for the good of the individual. God punishes out of love and not out of the pride of God. Look at the story of the fall. The book of Genesis says, Then the Lord God see, said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, what if he also reaches out his hand to take fruit from the tree of life and eats of it and lives forever? The Lord God therefore banished him from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he had been taken. He expelled the man, stationing the cherubim in the fire revolving sword east of the garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. At first glance, it looks very much and sounds very much like those pagan gods, right? Except when Adam and Eve sinned, they were indeed expelled from the garden, and even they set, he set that angel with the revolving sword at the garden so that they couldn't get to the tree of life. But why? Why did he do that? If it were simply vengeance, then why did God make them close? God took all care of them. He got them all set. You know, it was kind of like sending a child off to school. Got them all dressed up and bundled up and set them out of the garden and wouldn't allow them to come back into the garden. Why would, why would he mark Cain so that others would not kill him if it was just about vengeance? When God speaks to Adam and Eve after the fall, he explains all of the consequences of being disobedient, and the consequences, have, the consequences are two types. Two types of consequences. How they affected human beings inside and their very being, and how it affected their relationships. God said in the book of Genesis, cursed is the ground because of you. Even the ground was cursed because of what they did. But this is the ground from which they were made, 
And now even his relationship with the ground is affected. Even by that fall, by this, that disobedient act, even man's relationship with the ground is messed up. Now he'll have to toil the ground for his food. His relationship with his wife is affected. Their relationship with the snake is affected. Remember, the snake's going to bite at her heels. And so on and so forth. Certainly his relationship with God is damaged. The reality is that after the fall, man is living in a fallen state, and if he eats the fruit of the tree of life, he will live forever in that fallen state where he is a mess on the inside and a mess on the outside in his relationships. God makes sure that man and woman will not live forever, not out of jealousy, but out of love. He makes it so that they will not live forever in a fallen state, and almost immediately he begins promising them a Savior. And the Savior will give them a new heart and will recreate them. He will take their dry bones and bring them back to life. But in the meantime, God allows death so that there is a hope of redemption and eternal life in a state that is glorious. Now that's true love. It's not the immediate fix. It's the fix that works. Now the fact that the triune God is different from the pagan gods with all their human foibles becomes even more clear as he begins to be revealed in the coming of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Jesus describes his relationship with his people as that of a father with his beloved son. In fact, the matter of greatest importance to Christ after his relationship to the Father and the Holy Spirit is his relationship with his people, as in the story of the prodigal son. The sin which the prodigal son committed was not so much taking the father's property or going out and spending his money. The sin of the prodigal is leaving the father's house. The sin of the prodigal is failing to be a son to the father. This is exemplified not only by the joy that the father expresses upon his son's return, but the fact that the father was constantly looking for his son's return. He was standing there looking at the horizon, waiting him to come, for him to come back. That's what the sin was, was his departure from the father. But notice the prodigal says to the father when he does return, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. The prodigal son is restored to relationship with his father and perhaps for the first time has the sentiments and internal workings of a son. The prodigal is becoming a son for the first time. The elder son, on the other hand, considers himself righteous because he has not transgressed any precepts as the prodigal son did but he is scandalized by the love of a father, isn't he? Stanislas Lyonnais, a famous scripture scholar, wrote this. He said, the elder son does, of course, share the family life, but his soul remains the soul of a mercenary, not of a son, not of a brother. He reckons himself righteous on the ground that he violates no precept when, in fact, he transgresses the main duty that of being a son. The essential point of the son's existence is his relationship with the father, and this relationship binds together the inner workings of the father and the son. It's not just an external expression. The father and the son are somehow united and even in their being. And this understanding of sin and redemption is applied not only to the prodigal son to his father, but for all people to the almighty. And with this understanding, sin is not simply an exterior action, but something that arises from deep within the person, from their very identity. When we sin, who we are truly supposed to be gets messed up. 
Sin is not simply a transgression of a precept that remains outside of us, written on paper or stone. Sin is a transgression against our identity as sons and daughters of the Father. The fact that sin is something which changes us on the inside is even found in the Old Testament. We see it certainly in the story of the fall, but we also see it throughout the prophets. The prophet Jeremiah lamented over Israel, saying, these people say, non serviam, I will not serve, right? But the sin, that sin, I will not serve God, went to the very core of their being. That's why it was messed up. It was not just an eternal, external act, but one that was internal inside of them. And what was it that they would not do, the people of Israel in the time of Jeremiah? What was it that they said, I'm not going to serve? What did they refuse to do? They refused to bow down and worship him. And so they require not simply a goat sacrificed on an altar, but a remedy which goes to the soul of the matter, you might say. St. Paul, Paul bemoaned on this same uh, topic. St. Paul bemoaned in his letter to the Romans, he said, For I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not want. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, do it but sin that dwells in me. It's not just something on the outside. It's something inside of me that's taken hold of my heart. Hence, the remedy must be something interior. It must be a complete turning of man back to his filial relationship with God. The problem is that fallen man cannot do this all by himself. That same scripture scholar, Stanislaus Leonet, wrote this. He said, man cannot be liberated from the tyranny of sin except by receiving a new dynamism, the life-giving spirit, the spirit of God, the only source of life. Now, Stanislaus Leonet was a scripture scholar, not a sacramental theologian. And so he, but he yet goes a great deal further. He says this, he says, Christ liberated man from the slavery of sin through a mediation accomplished in a supreme act of obedience and love in which we participate in baptism and in the Eucharist. And so we come to the new covenant the one who is consubstantial with the Father and incarnate of the Virgin Mary, as we hear in our new creed, right? The Word made flesh. Jesus Christ possesses both a human and a divine nature in one divine person, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And that's essential. It sounds very conceptual. It sounds very intellectual. But if we didn't believe that as Catholics, our whole faith would be different. The way we worship would be completely different if we didn't believe that simple truth that in the very earliest centuries of the church, like St. Cyril of Alexandria that we, we remember today, if it weren't for him, our whole church would look completely different. But Jesus Christ is able to represent man to God man finally uttering his obedient yes to God, while at the same time he's able to sanctify man because he is God. It's the perfect solution. Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man because he is both in himself human and divine. He is truly and substantially both. He is not pretending to be a man. He truly is in his being man. He is, however, also truly the Almighty in his very being. He is not like God. He is God. He is not like a man. He is man. Hence, the relationship between God and man is restored in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not simply the word of God, the principle of creation, but also the word made flesh. And this is when it really becomes interesting because the Paschal mystery then is Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. And the incarnation makes that redemption possible, which is accomplished by Christ's real sacrifice on the cross. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this, and I think this is on your sheet. 
Christ's death is both, both the paschal sacrifice that accomplishes the definitive redemption of, man, of men through the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, and the sacrifice of the new covenant, which restores man to communion with God by reconciling him to God through the blood of the covenant, which was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We all know what that is. It's the center of our faith. We celebrate that every Sunday, right, when we come to Mass. We celebrate that in the Holy Triduum, the Paschal Sacrifice. That's all that means. But Christ exercises this perfect act of obedience, which is exactly contrary to that non serviam of the Israelites. I'm not going to serve in Jeremiah's day, which Jeremiah mourned. Christ not only serves, Christ not only loves, he loves completely and selflessly. St. Paul wrote, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself on the cross. But this sacrifice is not simply a price that's being paid for a debt. It's not just a price being paid for a debt. There's something far more important. And this is why that discussion of creation and the Trinity at the beginning was so important. Indeed, a debt is being paid. There's no doubt about that. But it's not just that, because there's a reason why that debt is being paid, one that's far more important. And that is that the purpose of this sacrifice is union. The goal of his sacrifice was to restore the union of God's people to him. And this union is not a union written on tablets of stone, but a union of being. God wants us to be one with him, not just symbolically. Not just any longer is that host going to be, that, uh, that piece of bread going to be the body of Christ. He wants to also be one with us. That's incredible if you think about it. Us, one with God? Do we really believe that as Catholics? That seems kind of out there. But this union is so complete and profound that it's likened to the first creation, the creation from nothing. You know, there's that word uh, that is used in the book of Genesis, bara, that means that God can create from nothing because God's the only one who can create from nothing, right? That word's used three times in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, when Yao, the second time is when Yahweh reminds his people who he is and of his covenant with them before sa saving them, bringing them out of Egypt, right? And then also in the prophets to signify the moment when God would create a new heaven and a new earth. That is where, that's where we come in. And from the earliest days of the church, we hear the fathers not using tentative explanations of this union between God and human beings, but uninhibited, uninhibited descriptions of it. It's all over the place. Basically, you pick a father of the church, and there's something there about it. They were not tentative about explaining that the goal of Christ's incarnation, of his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection and ascension, was the complete union of human beings with the most holy trinity in Jesus Christ. I give you some of the examples on your sheets. I have books full of these citations. Thousands of pages. The fathers use not only words like union, but even divinization. Now, I don't have the time or the expertise to explain to you precisely how that can be. And scholars throughout the generations have attempted to explain it. But it is the Orthodox Catholic teaching that this union is not just symbolic, but what we call ontological. That means in being. It's not something superficial. How this is exactly is one of the mysteries of our faith. But the indwelling of the Trinity and the union of his adopted sons and the one son, Jesus Christ, is the heart of our faith. It's not just about feeling good. It's about being united with the Almighty. And that requires a sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ and also 
us uniting our sacrifice with Christ, that of Christ. I'm just going to read you a couple of those citations. Because if you really think about what these fathers are saying, it's incredible how much God loves us and how much he wants to be united to us. And we're talking, I would, uh, would, would a husband ever say his relationship with his wife is symbolic? Absolutely not. She would kid him one right across the chops, right? So why would we ever say that about our, what God wants in his relationship with us? This is what St. Uh, of course, St. Paul describes Christ as the head and we are his members, right? That's all over St. Paul. St. Irenaeus wrote, Christ has united man to God. For this, is what, for this it was necessary that the mediator of God and men should possess the nature of both in order to restore friendship and concord between them, to present man to God and to manifest God to man. For how could we share in the adoption of sons unless the son had given us communion with the Son, and unless the Word had united himself to us by becoming flesh. For this he came in all ages to restore all to communion with God. That's why he came, to restore all to communion with God. And he doesn't mean just buddies. Origen wrote, as the visible body of Jesus was nailed to the cross and buried and then raised up, so the whole body of Christ's saints is nailed with him to the cross and now no longer lives. But when the resurrection of this true and complete body takes place, you know, at the end of the time, then the members of Christ, which now resemble dry bones, shall be united bone to bone and joint to joint. Each will have its proper place and all together they will form the perfect man according to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Then shall the many members be one body, since all the members will belong to the same body, Christ's body. He's not talking symbolically. St. Athanasius for this was the union effected, that he who is man by nature might be united with him who by nature is God. And that thus our salvation and our deification might be lastly assured. Such is the love for men that he will to become father by grace of those whom he created. This takes place when men who are mere creatures receive in their hearts the spirit of the son crying, Abba, Father. Another one from St. Athanasius. These are they who, on receiving the word, receive of him the power to become sons of God. Now, just like the prodigal, right? Now, since they are but creatures, they could not become sons unless they received the spirit of him who is the natural and true son of God. Therefore was the word made flesh to render man capable of receiving the divinity let me read that again. Therefore was the word made flesh to render man capable of receiving the divinity. We are not sons of God by nature, but the son who is within us is by nature. Nor is God our father by nature, but he is the father of the word who is in us, in whom and by whom we cry, Abba, Father. He is the father of the word who is in us in whom and by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Christ's words become our words. Christ's actions become our actions. Christ's sacrifice, our sacrifice. We are united to the Logos. But how does this union happen? This amazing thing? Remember again the words of Pope Benedict. If everything is directed to the covenant, then it is important to see that the covenant is a relationship, God's gift of himself to man, but also man's response to God. Man's response to God who is good to him is love, and loving God means worshiping him. The liturgy, the Eucharist, the sacraments. And who celebrates the liturgy? Three groups, the Holy Trinity, 
the other heavenly participants and the earthly participants, you and me. St. Paul wrote to the Romans, I urge you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. In the Eucharist, we take his sacrifice, indeed all of him, body, blood, soul, and divinity, into ourselves. Not symbolically. The relationship is real. So the effect is real. So much so that St. Augustine, speaking as if he were speaking for the Eucharistic Christ, said this. He said, I am the food of grown men. Grow and you shall feed upon me. Nor shall you change me like the food of your flesh into yourself, but you shall be changed into me. Wow. When a baptized Christian celebrates the Eucharist and receives the Eucharist worthily, we are affirming that we are under his headship. We bow down in worship and we turn back to him. And in return, Christ gives us himself and unites us ever more fully to himself. We are sons in the one son, children in the one son, members of his mystical body. And we are completely free in him. So, Trinity, creation, fall, covenant, worship. All are united in that one mystery of the Almighty. So let us stand together and pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of yourself that you give completely to us so that we may draw, be drawn ever into more intimate friendship with you. And so we pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. You made a comment near the end of the presentation about uh, it's not just about feeling good but being united to the Almighty, and that requires a sacrifice. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I guess it goes to the sufficiency of, of Christ's sacrifice, right? So, um, when we sinned, right, we created a disorder in the universe, right? And um, not only with Adam and Eve's sin, but also with our own sins the effects of that sin go far beyond uh, ourselves, right? Um, the, real, the reason that our world is messed up is because of sin, right? Because we haven't followed uh, God and we have tried to make ourselves above God in some way. But the example that God gives us even in himself is completely emptying himself, right? That the misnomer, and you might take it even from a, a more phenomenological perspective of our own culture. So in our own culture, um, we are taught that what makes us more of a person or a better person is how much we have and how much we get, right? And the Christian message is the exact opposite. And the reality, not just the Christian message, but the reality of the human person is that in fact, um, what matters is not what we get or hold or obtain, but what we give, right? So when we love someone, you know, we don't know we're loved by how much the other person buys us, right? Now, I, I don't mean to be letting any husbands off the hook here, okay? 
but it means by how much those two individuals give themselves completely to the other, right? So it's abandonment. It's self-emptying. And it's not just the thing, but the giving of one person to the other, and that's what we're talking about, right? So there's, when, we, when it comes to sacrifice, and Christ makes his sacrifice on the cross, his complete self-emptying on the cross, he takes that burden upon himself because we are not able to. Right? But because of his sacrifice, now you and I are also able to unite our human sacrifices, the things we do throughout our lives, the little things or big things, the struggles we go through. Right, We're able to unite those to his. And because we unite that sacrifice to his, then even our sacrifices can have real value. We're now capable of a truly selfless act of love because of his grace. Is that, I don't know, maybe I'm not, Getting your point. No, you can get your point. In fact, you said something earlier that I think the whole father son reunion, if you will, requires us to be completely empty. Mm -hmm. As human beings, how can, what's the only way we can be completely empty is death. Because we're filled with Christ, right? Christ was active. Yeah. And yet his, his completely filling us doesn't destroy us, right? And that's, that's why, that's why, that's one of the, why the, the, he ha, had a human and divine nature, right? Because, and then this is one of the big, this is the big controversy, in fact, St. Cyril of Alexandria today, that, that when the human and divine nature were united, the divine nature didn't obliterate the human nature, didn't even obliterate the human soul didn't, of, of Christ, didn't obliterate his human will. Uh, all of that was intact. That's, that's, that's how much effort God put into redeeming us and still maintaining our freedom. So now we're free. In fact, he could, he, could he have rectified the whole situation with a zap? Sure. But in so doing, he would have taken away our freedom. And if he takes away our freedom, then we can't love. You can't be coerced to love someone. Not truly love them, right? And he wanted us to be agents who can love. So when he redeemed us, he had to make sure that he allowed us to keep our free will. Now, the danger of that is that we can also reject him, right? But, yeah. Sure. Yes. Talk a little bit about the balance between us arguing with God and arguing with the other people present. Sure. All or the other, and it has to be some sort of balance. Am I making myself? I I think so. I'll try to I'll try to address it, and then if I don't, you can clarify. Okay. Um, we certainly when we pray, our Father, we say our Father, right? We're praying as a community to our Father in heaven. He is all of our Father. Um, and we, at Mass, we offer a sign of peace, right? In the idea, of, in the golden rule, right? Um, it is love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? The two, the love of God and love of neighbor, are intricately linked, right? When at the end of time we're united with Christ, uh, we pray, you know, at the end in heaven, and we are all united together in him, He's the focus. He's, we're united in him. Now, by that mere fact means that we are also united with each other perfectly, right? Because we can't be perfectly united with him if not with each other. That's the idea. So we always have, we have to be careful that our focus, even at the liturgy, is on Christ. Because if we focus on Christ, then that automatically, not simply requires us, but if our union with Christ is actual, is real, then we can't help but love our neighbor. If we are bowing down in worship to the Father, um, I'll give you a concrete example. With 
when we're training the altar servers, one of the things that we, one of the lessons we teach is that, and the principles we operate by, is that if that server reverences Christ in the Eucharist, if he learns what, or she, learns what reverence is, then how much better chance is there that then he's going to also reverence the people around him? Because he knows what reverence is. That he's going to reverence not just Christ, but every life that Christ has created. So if we're genuine in bowing down to Christ in worship, that should affect our relationships, but Christ is always has to be, Christ is always has to be primary. And that's what makes us truly free, right? That, that's the idea. That was the misnomer. Adam and Eve thought they could do this on their own, right? I'm going to take from the tree of knowledge, right? But what does God end up giving them in the end? He divinizes them. He makes them like him. It's not that he's being stingy. But he knows that they can't get to him if it's all about them. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, given all of the background that you gave us yeah. and what's behind the liturgy, mm -hmm. uh, could you say something about the distinction between uh, the liturgy being something we receive versus the liturgy being something we create and make? Mm -hmm. Does that question make sense? I think so. I'll, how, would that, how would that play out at, uh, at the Sunday Mass? That was yeah. That's a good question. Um, well, because God chooses to uh, have us cooperate in this mystery, right? And that's kind of the whole point, is that this isn't... Um, even, in, even within the liturgy, it's a reciprocal relationship. So, you know, from the very start, the priest says, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and everybody says, Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit, right? And I don't say, and with your spirit, and you don't see the Lord be with you, right? From the very start of the liturgy, it's reciprocal. And yet, uh, when we're, ta we're talking about the mystical body of Christ, and we're talking about Christ's headship. There's that passage I read from the Catechism of the Catholic Church that in the liturgy, uh, we in way, some way submit ourselves to the headship of Jesus Christ. He's the head. We are the body. We are the members. Okay? So that means even in the liturgy, that's reflected, but each person has their own role, right? But it's always Christ accomplishing it. Am I getting, am I hitting it or am I missing I'm going from uh, Pope Benedict's Spirit of the Liturgy. Yeah. His, one of his big points is the idea of coming and sitting down and creating the liturgy and being totally creative is against the, the idea of... Uh, that we're creating it. Yeah, yeah it's okay. that we receive and not rather something we, we artificially make. Well, a absolutely. Well, ultimately, yeah, right. And you see that most profoundly at communion, right? The church is very specific that when we're distributing communion, the minister says the body of Christ, and you receive communion. You never take communion. Now, sometimes it happens, right? But it's why the, you see the minister when somebody, because you stand there and they go, whoosh, and, you, and you go, right? You know? Because the whole idea is that this is God giving this to you. Giving, it's, it's an act of love, right? An act of love you are receiving. And, and that takes a humility to, to receive. But who is it that uh, confects the Eucharist on the altar? It's not even the priest, right? It's the Almighty working through the priest. I am simply the, the instrument, the minister, which is what that means, right? It's God doing it. And so that's why, for example, the church gives us what she does. Why we just went through this whole thing with the Roman Missal, right? Because, you know, every once in a while, I'll get someone, um, and they, I mean, it can be a lot of reasons, but they're upset because I chose to read a particular reading 
on a particular day at Mass, right? You know, they, you shouldn't have picked... I didn't pick that reading, right? That's what the church gave us. We follow the cycle of readings that the church has given us because the liturgy's not mine, right? It belongs to God and to his church. And that's why God is able to communicate through it because I'm not making it up as I go. You know, what we do on Sunday, um, you know, it's kind of a joke among priests. Just follow the book, you know, follow the book. And, and so when we do, when we follow the book, right, because this is something that has been given to us through the long tradition of the church, right, God then can do his work. But when, if I start making it up, if I start doing what I think is really neat in the liturgy, instead of following what the church has given to us, then I'm doing it. And you know what? If me, Tom Malota, is doing it, it's going to end up pretty empty. You know, it's going to only last so long. But if it's the churches, you can't beat it. Is that, that's the point, yeah, okay. Yes. Because I can't, like we said, the man can't solve the problem of his sinfulness himself. Right? That's Pelagian. That's a heresy from way back. Okay? But, um, but God can. Christ can because he's both God and man. Yeah. So he allows us to make that response. Yes? I have such a hard time yeah. putting Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God as one. Yeah. Jesus is on the cross. Join the club, you know. <laughs> Join, so you know. He, Jesus talks to God, uh, and to your hands I commend my spirit. Why have you forsaken me? Right. All, and, and, and it's all to the Father. Mm-hmm. And I can see Jesus as a human. And, right. And I know he sent the Holy Spirit in the flames um, to the disciples yep. and all that. Yep. But it's so hard to put him... Into God. Yes. Yeah. Put him in. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, this is why it's a mystery, right? You know, of our faith and why it's so. I mean, boy, oh boy, there's a long list of people who uh, got it wrong, right? And it's it's not too uh, difficult uh, to uh, to struggle with that mystery. Uh, you know, um, for example. Uh, the, again, I go back to the saint we celebrate today, St. Cyril of Alexandria. He combated a heresy called Nestorianism. And Nestorius actually, you know, by both St. John Chrysostom's account and St. Cyril of Alexandria was a pretty holy guy, you know, and a pretty uh, well-meaning guy, right, trying to do the right thing. In fact, the reason he got himself into trouble because he was combating another heresy called Arianism that denied him. The, the divinity of Christ, and he went to the other extreme. And um, so uh, almost, well, really it was his followers, but uh, almost denying the humanity of Christ, saying the divine nature obliterates the, the human nature, right? And, and uh, that's not what we believe either. So there, but um, that's why we have a church too, right? And why she has been, she's very careful when, and very methodical about uh, matters of faith. Because the, our knowledge of God and the way we love God are actually more connected than we would like to admit, right? Because, and, but if you look at it from the perspective of just a human reality, you know, when you first see that person that you're really attracted to, right? you have a certain minimal knowledge of them. 
And then that, because of that knowledge, you start to approach that person a bit. And maybe you start to love them a bit because of that knowledge. But the more that you start to love that person, the more you want to get to know them, right? You start asking them all kinds of questions. Oh, where'd you grow up? And blah, blah, blah. And then as time goes on, you, there's this cycle of knowledge and love, right? And the more that I love, the more I want to come to know, and the more that I know, the more that I'm able to love that person, right? And so the, our knowledge uh, of who Jesus Christ is, our knowledge of God, comes to us through the deposit of faith, what's been revealed to us through Jesus Christ and in the Old Testament, and, uh, and then with the development of doctrine. And by that, I mean not that we come up with new truths, but over the centuries, we come to, the church has come to a better understanding of what has been given us, right? And that's when, when there's a disagreement, uh, is oftentimes when the church acts, and that's certainly what we see in the early centuries of the church. There, was, there were those who were saying, no, Christ is only uh, God, and others saying, no, he's only man. And then different ways uh, that that uh, happens, and how can this happen and be. And when there was this disagreement, they would call a council, you know. And uh, in particular, in the first five councils, uh, perhaps the first six councils of the church, is when the church defined who exactly Jesus Christ is, that he is uh, he has a human and divine nature and is one divine person, the second person of the Holy Trinity. But, you know, when the apostles first started this at the Council of Jerusalem, that, that hadn't, wasn't made clear yet. So um, it's, not a, um, it's not always easy, but um, we do the best we can to embrace that truth. Uh, because ultimately his divinity is essential for us to know that we can have that union with God, right? If he's just human, then all he is is an example to us. He's beyond human, that I know. Yeah. It's just that I can picture and relate to him where it's difficult sure. to get. Sure, sure, absolutely, sure. And maybe, and that's why, one of the reasons he became man, right? Became flesh, so, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to, I'll stick around if anybody wants to talk or whatever, but thank you very much for your attention and your time, and uh, have, a, have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thank you.